Okay. Uh, good morning. Good afternoon, everyone. This is the Dini Empire Advancement League. Uh, today with me, uh, our Honorable Vice President, uh, Mr. Ju Maui Osamu Jamin Orukbe. And uh, also joining us, uh, I'm seeing this right now, Mr. Joe Wise, also one of the honorable and executive leaders of this uh, great organization. Uh, I hope we can be able to fix the network problem we are having right now. On the... Good afternoon, sir. Can you hear me? Can, you, can any one of you hear me? So let's let's see if any one of them can uh, hear my voice. So I have to reposition myself because we are going to be sharing the screen. Yeah, uh, today we were trying to be talking about the the situation uh, in our state today. In our state, in the two state, and uh, in Nigeria as a whole, because. Uh, Benin people always say, or the Edo people always say, Adole Woji, say, Edenahakpa Abore. I'm talking about this issue because of what is going on in Edo states today between our Ibo governor, I don't know if I have to say Ibo, and the uh, and uh, our great holy land and the traditional uh, ruler of our empire. The issue is very, very uh, upsetting to say the fact. Uh, I'm sorry for the network uh, interruption that is uh, really going on and uh, Let's see if we can be able to manage the whole issue. Um, the situation uh, required uh, urgent attention from the Edo people, from the palace, and from all where meaning Edo people, not just organization in Nigeria, no, uh, the organization in Europe. Uh, people have been trying to form some certain uh, frontline or uh, uh, organization to confront this issue. Uh, we, the Great Benin, uh, the, the Benin Empire Advancement League, uh, we are going to be playing only a role uh, because we are a peaceful organization and uh, our en engagement is uh, quite defined by our constitution. Many people might be questioning our motives and uh, why we are not uh, playing a very important role. We are doing that in our own form. And uh, we are doing that, that the peace among the Beninists or the, those who are for and um, those who are against that remains intact. Because when the Dogama, the Guayama, but my that over in Togiraji. Before we go to where we are going to, I'm still trying to see if my uh, co uh, moderators, they are valuable now. Can you hear me, sir? Yeah, good morning, sir. Okay. Uh, good morning, sir. You are welcome back. If you are only working, yeah, thank you for very much. Uh, the network <laughs> is pretty bad. Yes, I can. I can see that. And uh, our executive uh, member, also Mr. Joe Wise, is I believe is strongly uh, with this uh, with his network because I can see him here, but can I cannot see his uh, video or picture as we may define it. So uh, today we are trying to talk about the marginalization of the South South in Nigeria and why, the, why do we, do we remain marginalized. 
this is supposed to be the topic of uh, our honorable uh, executive uh, leader, one of our executive leader, Mr. Joe Wise. But I don't know what is wrong with uh, his uh, network. It's like you are being confronted with several <laughs> network failure today. But notwithstanding, we are going to do the uh, the live show on the on the live broadcast. Uh, the way we can do it. So uh, the South South, as you all know, uh, in Nigeria, uh, is the food basket or the financial basket of the nation. But we are not, uh, in the sense, uh, profiting for all these uh, natural resources, the well-educated people from the South South, we cannot see them in the federal level in good positions. Uh, or the weight of Nigeria that is uh, always uh, taken from, from the South South that is uh, used in other parts of Nigeria, like the Eastern part of Nigeria and the Western part of Nigeria and the Northern part of Nigeria, we cannot receive the same amount they're having. They have more delegates than the South South, who is responsible for the financial of this nation, financing this nation. And uh, we are trying to look into the whole situation while we remain marginalized as we are today. So, sir, uh, Honorable Vice President, uh, I yes, want sir. to ask you a question. What do you okay, think, sir. and how do you think we can be able to go out of this uh, marginalization that is being imposed on us? I can say imposed on us by our people themselves, uh, who are refusing to support each other uh, <coughs> in all the government level or in election we have been doing. So uh, I want to know how can we fix the whole situation? How can we bring up cooperation between South South, the governors and others? So uh, can you give us a little, can you highlight us a little bit, sir, about the whole situation? All right. First of all, good morning um, to our viewers out there, wherever you are around the world. Uh, my name is Joe Osemudiame Maoli Ope, and I'm joining live from Accra. Okay, Mr. President, uh, as regards your question, I think yes. one of the things that um, needs to be done is there needs to be a political re-engineering in Nigeria. The political structure of the uh, political space right now, the structure yes. has to be um, abolished and a new structure has to be put in place. It is obviously clear that um, we cannot operate with this... Um, you know, political structure we have now because it's loop-sided, it's not working. It's obviously not working. We've tried everything in the past 22 years and it's obviously not working. Now, what I think we can do is we can, we can decide to uh, go back to regionalism with equal representation for all the regions, irrespective of what people think. Because when you look at... Um, the representation in the north, you yes. could clearly see that it was done in such a manner that it would favor the north, you know. But also, when we talk about the north, we would have to start actions, questions like who really is the north? Because uh, we have to define whether states like Benue, Kogi, Kwara, Abuja are also part of the north, you know. And so these are questions we we need to ask ourselves. You know, for me, I do not think this these states are part of the north, because when you look at, um, for instance, Benue and Kogi, um, yes. historically, part of Benue and Kogi used to be uh, a part of the Asian Union Empire. Yes, you know, and geographically, we cannot say it is north. You you understand, yes. and so you you notice that in in the in the fourth republic there's there's been this new political definition 
of um, the geographies in Nigeria. Now we have um, North Central, North East, North West. We have um, South East, South West, and we have South South. Yes. You know, so the question is, if you have North East, North West, and you have North Central, you know, we begin to ask ourselves, okay, shouldn't we have, a, you know, um, a regional arrangement based on these, um, you know, geographical definitions, these new geographical definitions that the political class is running around with, you know, yeah. so we could have six regions, for instance, and we can have equal representation in the six regions. You know, I have always said that uh, the politicians cannot be trusted and should not be trusted in any way. I have always held to my belief that uh, governance should be, you know, go back to the traditional institutions. The traditional institutions need to play a more important role, a more visible yeah. role um, in the day-to-day -day running of the affairs of the people. That is my, my belief. Um, it's not going to change. I do not think I there is any any other superior arguments, you know, to change this belief. Because we have seen how the United Emirates has been able to conduct itself, and I do not I do not think that uh, those who run the United Arab Emirates have seven heads. I think no. the reason why it's working is because there seems to be a conscious effort by the leadership to um, deliver the dividends of democracy to these people. You understand? Yeah. I, for instance, think that if we have some sort of monarchical democracy, the dependency on politics by these stars we have in our political space today will be drastically reduced. Now, people might say uh, absolute power. Those who make claims for absolute power are ignorant of um, the history the political history of the various kingdoms in, in, in that makes up Nigeria today. You know, for instance, in Edo, in Edo, present day Edo, we used to have the Beshet Bini Empire. Yes. The Oba never had absolute power. That's a clear fact. And I yes. think people should understand this. Now, when you look at the ancient Oyo kingdom, the, the, the Alafi of Oyo never had absolute power. You know? Exactly. And also, there are various smaller uh, clans and traditional um, rulers all across Nigeria. When you look at their history, you find out that they never had absolute power. What people uh, tend to define as absolute power is a connivance with a traditional council and a sitting king at that time to inflict untold hardship and terror yes. on the people. Historically, we have found that, that in some cases, in many cases, when a king Yeah, the issue of network is, uh, is something that uh, we cannot really help as of the moment. Uh, Yes, as you were saying, uh, absolute power was not given to any king in the in the Benin Empire. Uh, that is why we have the Uzamas and uh, all other uh, chiefs that help the Obas to uh, to govern uh, the Benin Empire before, and uh, we were having the the Inogie who were situated in in different different regions. Uh, governing uh, those regions. And we also have the Ohens, uh, which also play a part like the Enogi and uh, also the chief priest of any shrine of the great ancestors. And uh, we also have the Odion Wereh, which, which was the eldest person or the eldest male uh, in, 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 in the village or in that region, uh, who also take up the leadership. Uh, where we are today, Okagile and others, really Okagile is a servant to the Indians of the, every village. Okagile doesn't have any role to play that period. He was a messenger. He will be sent a message by the Indians and uh, he has to de deliver that message.
So sorry for that. Sorry for the interruption. So uh, this in the south south where we have today the restructuring we are supposed to be doing. Uh, like you said, part of Kogi State, we have some uh, Benins, our Benin brothers and sisters there, and some part of the Kwara State, we also have them there. And in, even in Imo, in, 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 in some part of uh, East, we also have our people there. So if Nigerian is going to be restructured, it should be restructured that every ethnic group has to have a say. Not the one we are having today, the Igbos and the Yorubas and the Hausas uh, dominate the, the day in and day out of Nigeria. Because uh, these people feel they own Nigeria. And we should start telling them, Nigeria doesn't belong to you. You have been destroying Nigeria for a very long time. Now it's time we take the ownership of Nigeria because the South South owns the revenue of Nigeria, owns the oil of Nigeria, owns all other mineral resources of Nigeria, like gas and others that we are using today. We can see all the whole economic of Nigeria today, from federal to local government, it's been sponsored by South South. And upon all this, we are still being marginalized and people don't really understand what is going on. So it is time the, the South Tards come together, come in the form of unity. No matter uh, the, the party you belong. Because if you look at what happened in Abuja, the other day, in the nomination that was going on. The South South, they were so disorganized and, and not quite the East, they were so disorganized. Money hungry, that they forgot their people, whom are, they are supposed to be supporting. Our uh, people might be calling me tribalist. I am not a tribalist, but what needs to be done, needs to be done. This three tribe has been ruling Nigeria and running Nigeria, Nigeria like their own private uh, property, right from creation. And this is why we are in this mess we are today, the Igbos, the Yorubas, and the, and the Hausas brought us this mess we are today, not the Benis, not the TVs, and not the other ethnic group, other smaller ethnic groups in Nigeria. We have to ask, start asking our self question. Do we allow ourselves to remain <coughs> in this mess where we are today? If we continue to be putting these people into power. Okay, look at, look at Tunumbu. Tunumbu couldn't even hold a flag. I'm not laughing at him because he's sick. I'm, I'm saying this for people to understand where we, are, where we are driving to. Where we are driving to. We were having a situation where Buhari was over two months, not in Nigeria, where Nigeria was not even having a government. He was taking a treatment in London or whatsoever. And now we are also driving to that direction. We are Tunubu, we'll be going to London three months, four months to take treatment of what I believe he has Parkinson. And people don't understand that because what Parkinson means, when you look at people when they are shaking, when they cannot hold something, they can't, they can't control themselves. That's, that's, that's a symptom of Parkinson. And we can see this in Tonobo. If we vote Tonobo into power today, then we are going to be having a situation where Nigeria will not be having a government. 
where everyone who is in the government will be feeding their pocket and do whatever they want. When you go to the issue of Atiku, I can remember what Obasa just said about Atiku. I don't know people if people remember that because uh, uh, Benin's always say, or there are those people always say, Etegari, Aye, Obalo. That means if the sore the, or the wound in your body, if it's recovered, sometimes it doesn't remember the pain you endure or you have to endure. Uh, we should look at that because uh, Atiku was once a vice president of uh, uh, Obasanjo, and we knew what Obasanjo said about Atiku that period. And then we come to the issue of Peter Obi, uh, which uh, so many of my state people are just supporting blindly today. Uh, we should look at his past record, and I believe people will also have something to say. So I will give the microphone back to our honorable vice president to continue where he stopped before the network disrupts us. So thank you, sir. You are welcome thank back. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Mr. President. Then I think it's pretty bad. Yeah. Um, like I was saying, um, I really didn't know where I stopped now, you know, but I, I I'll just go um, over it again. I said yes. that there was a need for us to have a, so a sovereign national conference where um, the desires of the people or the aspirations of the people um, will be discussed. We need to know, the people need to determine how they want to be governed, who they want to govern them, and the duration in which they want, uh, you know, these leaders to hold office. Yes. I also think um, we need to first determine, define how we got to the, the, where we are today. You know, and in doing so, we would have we would, it would help us understand so many mistakes we have made, and the roles, the deli the roles some people have have, have, have played to okay. deliberately uh, put the country in the situation it is finding itself today. You know, I've always said it: when the British came, they took power, they usurped power, they stole power from uh, um, the monarchs. Um, you know, looted and plundered every part of Nigeria. Yes. Now, when they were leaving, they didn't hand over power back to the monarchs. They created a political system that would benefit them and got private citizens, private dwells, who they have seen to be greedy and, and had um, an insatiable test for power. They groomed those people um, with the pretense of, you know, having multi party democracy, and handed over power to these people, knowing fully well that these people have no connection with the masses. And we have seen how these people, these private citizens who have become the political class, have steered the ship of Nigeria since 1957. It's been from one chaos to the other. We have seen how even people like Awolowo, how they made a fortune out of the misadventures of Nigerians. You could go to the East, you could say the same thing. You could go up north, you could say the same thing. We have seen how retired military generals, you know, have become overnight billionaires. People who do not have anything to show, who cannot even dis uh, defend the source of their wealth. And they have plundered. You see, the political system today is a system that benefits the neo-colonialists. It is a system that benefits people who do not have a connection with the, the cities of this country. And that is why I have always said that practicing monarchical democracy would benefit us more because it's going to cost, cut the costs of government. Yeah. drastically. It is going to cut the governance drastically and it would give enough time for monarchs to be able to go about establishing, setting up projects that are going to be beneficial to the people. 
I'm going to I'm going to explain this to to you so that we, we can understand where we where we have found ourselves. You have a constitution that says a, a term is four years, and so a man contests for election. He wins election. Now he, it takes him six to one year, six months to one year to settle down in office. He he sends a budget to the parliament. The budget is passed. He's already behind schedule. Yes. Now he takes that budget into the next second year and tries to implement certain things. By the time the second year is, is done, he goes into the third year. That's an election year. And so parties will already start having their primary. The fourth year is where there's the election proper. So you find in four years, the man only has just about one year, six months to govern. And that is what it is. When he, he eventually seeks re-election and wins a second term, he needs to now recalibrate his government. And so he has a first, first year in his second term and then he in his, in, his, in his second term. Then by the third year, he's already battling to impose a successor. And there's a party primary again. So you find out that in eight years, the politician just has about three years to govern. And some of us have looked into this situation and we have found out that it is not beneficial to the people. Because we've never had a time that the president of this country, a governor or the local government chairman, is owed salary. Yeah. We've never had a time where an ex-president or an ex-governor is owed pension. But take a look at those who have suffered, who have toiled to make this nation great. The teachers, the doctors, the nurses, civil servants, public servants, they are always owed gratuities, always owed salaries. The political class is living large on the masses. Yes. They have all sort of um, um, allowances, hardship allowance, newspaper allowance, accommodation allowance, property allowance, wardrobe allowance. When they travel, abroad they have extra codes so you can see that these people who say they are um, putting themselves forward to serve us are actually the ones we are serving exactly and so this political system itself is not that of servitude it's a slave master political arrangement where politician is the slave master and we, the citizens, are the slaves. And clearly that's what it is. And so this system cannot work. And I have said that Nigeria is not going to work as long as this system exists. Because the politician has no connection to the people. Exactly. They just see the people as... Um, a willing tool. That is what it is. And so what we see in southern Nigeria is a reflection of the system. The system was created to function that way. And that is why you see people go to the bank, acquire loan, sell their properties, so that they can bribe it, so that they can be party flag bearers. When there's a, a, a national election or a statewide election, you have the same people, just like we've seen in a kitty state, and get to vote by it. Now, when these people get into power, they are not going to feel any remorse, any empathy on the masses. The first thing they think of is how they are going to recover the money they have spent. And that is what we see today. 
And that is why you see the politicians are willing to punish their people. And I have always said it. The APC and the PDP would rather match as a political party than for them to allow power to be handed over to nationalists, to patriots, to people who can change the system. Because the APC and the PDP is made up of criminals. Yes. The earlier we realize it, the better for us. The APC and the PDP, as we see today, 80 to 85 percent of the major players in those parties are thieves. Yes. From the governors to the presidents to the ex presidents, state house of assembly members, federal house of legislative members, to the and local government chairman. These people are thieves. You don't even need to believe what I'm saying. Just look around you. 22 years of civil rule. Our roads are still not motoring. Yet there are budgets for them. We have sold power to private entities. Yet we do not have power. Our, 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 our ports are not working. The railway is not working. The educational sector is comatose. Our health system is cash and carry. Yet we have budgets for, 20, for the past 22 years. For all those things, it clearly shows to you that the people who have held this country have held this country to ransom in the last 22 years. They have stolen, they have looted, they have plundered our commonwealth. That is what it is. I am baffled that we still have youths in the country today who are sitting down in the comfort, in the discomfort of their homes and championing the cause of these political parties. I am surprised. Youths who are at home because ASU is on strike are still advocating for these political parties. Youth who cannot even work because they, 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 they could be kidnapped are sitting down in the discomfort of their homes and are asking us to vote for these political parties. It helps me. It clearly shows you that the people love their chains. It clearly shows you that the people love their slave masters. It clearly shows you that the people are willing players. They have willfully played their part in this total national misfortune, national tragedy that we have found ourselves today. In the case of the South-South, there is no difference between the politician in the South-South and the politician in the Southwest. There is no difference in the, between the politician in the South South and the politician in the South East. These people do not consult the people. They do not think about the people. They only want to loot, steal, put our carry our money, and invest in Europe, buy properties in Dubai and in Americas. That is what they are interested in doing. They are not interested in creating jobs. They are not interested in creating an enabling environment where people can, can dream, where the aspirations of the people can be met. They are not interested in all that. No. What they are interested in is to just loot. And you see, the Europeans keep telling us that we, there's so much corruption in the system. But let us ask the Europeans, where are the money scarce? In the European banks, who is aiding this corrupt politician? European lawyers. That is it. So there is so much hypocrisy going all around in the system. Because the politician is benefiting from the system the Europeans are benefiting from the system.
Now the Asians have joined in in, in this whole movement, yeah. and they are paying our resources on any basis. There is no accountability anywhere. No accountability. And that is what this, that is the situation we have found ourselves today. And that is why for me, I have always insisted that we need to have power back, power back to the monarchs. Because let me explain this. When we had the Asian Bindo, we had a council, the traditional council, to deliberate on issues, think. These people did everything they did selflessly. Sometimes they were compensated for their service to the people. Many a times they were not. The monarch did not need a minister that is on a payroll. We had our dukes who were head of the dukedoms and they controlled the, affair, the political affairs in their, in their own areas. They did not need commissioners. They had their own traditional councils. Then when you go down a little bit, we have the Ogiamez. And they had a way of, you know, organizing their own local areas too. In no, in no and game. everything they did, everything they did, they did from their hearts for the well-being of their people, asking for nothing in return. But look at the political system today. We have the president. We feed the president. We cater for the president's health. We, we, uh, we accommodate the president. We ferry the pres president in the best of cars. We secure the president with the best of the security. The people who are feeding, who are accommodating the president, they don't have food to eat. They don't have roof over their head. The pe people whose, whose commonwealth is here, the president, are living in insecurity. This will provide for 24 hour power supply for the president are sleeping in darkness. Now, when the president retires from office, he gets extra shares. He's paid for the rest of his life. He chooses to go anywhere he wants to go at the expense of the, of the people. What kind of system is this? It clearly shows that there's a total disconnect. And that is why I have always held the opinion that this system is not going to work until we go back to how it used to be. We can have a monarchy, a monarchy a democracy, where the Uber of Bini, for instance, is the head of state in his own region. Then we can have a private individuals who would contest to be in parliament, in parliament, so we can have a parliamentary system. Then we can have the dukes, the energies, handle their own areas. Then we have the police under the control, the direct control of the monarch. Yes. Now the monarch is not a partisan politician. So he's going to be able to, to uh, uh, adjudicate and pass judgment that is fair because of partisan. That is a system that works when there are no state governors. Because there is no need for all this. You see, we are just creating more mess. Exactly. And that is why nothing is working, Mr. President. That's just all I have to say for now. Okay, thank you very much. I always enjoy your your view and uh, your advice as well. Uh, thank you very much for that. So our thank honorable, one of our honorable leader is back, uh, the person of uh, Joe Wise. 
So I hope he also contribute uh, his part uh, in this moment. So you are welcome, sir. Uh, please just introduce yourself a little bit so that we can uh, move on to the next stage. Oh, we are having a... Okay, sir. Just just a moment. Uh, but does he have tune? It's like you have to unmute your microphone. <clears throat> okay, just say something so that we know if we can hear you or not. No, we, we can't hear you. Okay. Uh, as our secretary uh, keep working on this uh, microphone, uh, let me just add a little to you uh, why Nigeria is what Nigeria is in this situation today, where Nigeria is. Uh, in the olden days, before the British came to, to, the, to the land of the Bini Empire, or the so-called Nigeria yet, uh, where we are now, uh, there was only one unknown king, unknown government in this region, you know, and this was the Bini Empire, the king of Bini. Okay. No. Sorry for the interruption. So there was only, only one no king, and this king was the king of the Bini Empire. And uh, the people who called themselves Yoruba today, there was no king. In that fact, there was no kingdom. They were province. Likewise, the Igbo. There was no king. And there was no pattern of government. So this is why we, where, where we are suffering today. Because these people, they don't have knowledge of ruling, of administrative. They don't have any feeling for their people. Before then, Bini has been able to produce so many leaders, great leaders, great kings. We have also uh, autonomous governments in everywhere who only pay homage to the Bini Empire, who rules themselves. But when we look at the situation, the, the British did not knew exactly what they were doing when they were leaving Nigeria, why they were ha handling power to these people. Because they knew exactly they can be able to man, uh, uh, have, manipulate these people anytime they want to, man to manipulate them. And this is what is going. That is why Nigeria was a company given that it did need company. Even as we are talking today, the British still play a heavy role in the government of Nigeria, making decisions and others. Without the British signing any government in Nigeria, the government is not going to function. What they needed to do was to surpass with these people, with these three sets of people, to make sure these people remain in power, that the Benins never come up because they know when the Benin come up, Nigeria will, is going to rise. Nigeria is going to rise. Nigeria will be having a great government. But the British will not allow that because they are so afraid of the Benin Empire because they knew if the Benin Empire rise and taking over his rightful place in Nigeria, uh, the Nigeria government is going to be like the one in Dubai or all other countries, you know, like and other areas. So, uh, the, 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 the Nigerian government you are seeing today, they are not, they are not uh, dependent, they are independent. 
they depend on all decision making from foreign countries. From America, we have a great influence. From the British, we, we have a great, a great influence. From the European Union, even from the APEC, Asian uh, uh, economic power. Look at what China is doing in our land today. They are, they are coming with the protest of uh, in investing in our land. Why they are looting us? Why our leaders are blind to see this? People doesn't really understand. If you go to, in, even Nigeria is, is a little bit okay, but go to other countries like Ghana, where these people, we just set up a mining uh, industry without even a license. Taking the gold out of Ghana, even without the approval of the Ghana government. <coughs> Likewise, Nigeria, the same thing is happening in Nigeria today. We are having government who doesn't have control over their own governance. The only thing they do, if anybody stand up and say something, they will call the army to, to deal with everybody. So the, the South South has it on its hand before this nomination, but they refuse to utilize this opportunity that we'll be having. Because if you vote for Peter Obi, you are voting for an Igbo man who has been ruling the nation Nigeria. If you vote for Atiku, you will vote for an Hausa, uh, uh, Fulani man, <coughs> who has been ruling Nigeria for over 60 years. If you vote for Tonubu, you will vote for a person, a Yoruba person, who also contributed at least 60 percent of the problem we are having today in Nigeria. So things are not going to change if we don't want things to change. Look at the vote buying. Look at the huge amount of money that is being used to buy votes. If we use that money to create at least three industries or companies, a technological companies in Nigeria, I believe they were able to employ more people in the, in the future. I, I, I am not blaming the youth because the youth only pick what they learned from their elders. They just look what the elders are doing. And this is what they are picking. When I look at the other day, an interview from our, one of our other statement saying uh, he doesn't blame the youth for collecting this money uh, because uh, they need it. This money is being looted from us. It's like you are supporting what is going on in that country because the youth is lack of direction. They doesn't know where they are going to. They don't even know where they are coming from. This is the time to, to start educating our youth, to, 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 to allow them to know that stomach pain is not just only for one day. You eat today, you belly full, but tomorrow is another day. Because that food you ate today will only serve you today. Tomorrow you will be hungry again. And this was the time. Because there's, there's, there's a parable, or there's a say in, in a dual language, Aga be mila, ya muji yo hame be, ede a yewe be, o hame yewe bo man. If you keep a cow to eat, to satisfy the hungry you are having today, tomorrow you will still go hungry. But you can prepare for tomorrow, that you won't go hungry, that you, have, you still have a little to eat for tomorrow. This is what our youth is not doing. And this is what our leaders are not teaching. And this is what our leaders are not investing in because they are profiting from it. They are enjoying it. They are enjoying when our people come to lie down for them. To say, ba 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 And uh, I think that is the behavior of the Yorubas. 
And uh, the Igbos, they, become, they start saying, Asia go, Asia go, Asia go, you know. And uh, the house house, I know how they, they do it. They just lie down and, and search, say so, some sort of things. And these are people you don't even know about before they come into political arena. All people now will be lying down on, they will be cooking day in and day out in their house, having people. People will not be just like a slave to them. I have never seen such a thing in, in Europe since I entered Europe. Party nomination is being done by vote. You vote it from your house. And when you go there where you where the delegates come in to, to, to nominate, everybody sit down, you sit on your seat and you, you drop your card. Somebody will be pick, taking the bus or everybody will be going there to drop his card on the bus to nominate the person he wants to nominate. There's nothing like money sharing. So it's, it's, it's a disgrace to the nation of Nigeria because Nigeria is only a name because it's a disgrace to the citizens of Nigeria doing that. I am not saying the Europeans and the Americans, they are not corrupt. They are fully corrupt as our politicians but they make something out of it. They make something out of it. The money that is coming out of this corruption is also invested in their own land. They don't take it to any other land. It's been in invested in their land. It's not taken to any other land to go and invest it or to go and put it in a savings bank in, this, in, in another country. Hardly see it. There's no country that is more corrupt than, than European countries or the American countries. But our own is in a different level because we don't keep what we have in our country. We take what we have, we take it to another people to help them develop. So it's, it is time we start fighting for ourselves because these people, they are not coming to build our country. We are going to build our country ourselves. And if we are dividing the country today, the country called Nigeria, I believe everybody should take what they brought in. The Benin Empire will take what he brought into Nigeria. And the Northerners, they will take their own part. The, mid, the Middle Bed, the Easterners, what they brought in. The Western art was the brought in. You don't expect now to, 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 to do land grabbing from other people to enrich yourself. And when we talk about dividing this country, I don't think that is the, the, the rightful way to say the fact because it is these people who are still in power. They will remain in power in those countries. They are still going to be uh, uh, managing the affairs of, the, of that country day in and day out. Because I believe every black citizen or every black man in this world, we are families. We are brothers and sisters. We need to care for each other. That is why I'm saying this, that, that it's not, it will not be the best in the best interest of black people because black people they are very very proud of uh, nigeria that country nigeria no matter what everyone will say if you go out today and say you are nigeria oh nigeria if you go out and say togo then we ask you where is togo but everybody know nigeria everybody know nigeria is the powerhouse of africa and that is why it's so disgraceful that we cannot be able to be managing our affairs. And people will be calling on other countries to be managing our affairs for us. When I listen to some people who says, ah, we should bring in the British to come and, come and do it for us, they forgot what the British did to us. The British, this, the, especially from the South South, today, if you go to the Caribbean, you see the citizens of South South uh, you go just just go come to the Dominican Republic, Jamaica, Haiti, and so on. 
These are sad South citizens that was taken from us with food force. And when they tell you what they go through, then you will now know that there's a good reason the British should step their footstep in our territory again. Not just only that, what they did to our people in Nigeria, what they did to our kinship, our pattern system of government, what they did. The South South should have learned from that because that's why I make this statement before because this is what the Benin always said. If the soul or the wounds you will have, and if it is, then you will never remember the pain you endure. And this is what is wrong with us. We are not learning from our mistakes. Instead of learning from our mistakes, we are even infusing more mistakes into our problem. And that is the, that is the problem we're having. So are you back, sir? Honorable Vice, uh, Honorable Secretary, can you hear me now? Say something so that I know if you are hearing me. Can you hear me? Okay, let me send him a message because I wanted to con him to contribute his part. So, can you, can you hear me? So sorry, it's like he cannot hear me. Uh, okay. So he can't hear me. The technical problem also remain uh, because our vice president already left and uh, because of the network problem. I believe uh, we have to do some research uh, while we're having this issue time after time on the let's see what we can do about it so the 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 system of which i was talking about uh you know this problem is not just nigeria but especially our west african uh brothers and sisters uh, we have this problem if you go a bit to the east africa they just have another mentality they have the mentality of freedom they have the mentality of self-determination, not to be governed by any foreign power. If you go to West Africa, you only hear people say the British should come and repair it. The British should come and repair it. Who is going there to repair British for them? They are doing it themselves. They are not waiting for the for Obi. They are not waiting for Tunubu. They are not waiting for Atiku to do it for them. They are doing it themselves. And they are very, very successful in doing it. They learn from their mistake. They know how to vote out their leaders, their bad leaders. But we continue to vote our bad leaders in. That is the problem. The Nigeria youth need a direction. They need a sense of direction. Because you cannot just take power without knowing what to do with the power. If you said as a youth you need power, let us see what you did in the nomination period. Let's see your hand. Your handwriting was so poor. Was so poor that I will not even advise the old people to give you power. Because it's going to be a total destruction then of what we saw. We need to start growing ourselves, the, especially the people from the old Bini Empire. Because if Nigeria continue this way, one day there will be no Nigeria. We will be having, having ourselves. How do we manage ourselves? From my own, from my own, I would prefer a monarchical pattern of 
government where our monarch we have at least 75% of the power be given to them with the help of the whole citizens. The other people should be a sort of democratic elected president and the other form. The army, the police should be brought under our traditional rulers. Because we know in the old days, the Bini Empire was having police. The Ogbalegbe, who used to bring broad message to other people. We were having our army who defend our citizens. They don't go on, they don't go after uh, unarmed citizens or something like that. So we need to do something preparing ourselves for the worst case scenario because it's coming and i believe it's coming because if yoruba lost if Igbo lost then we are going to be coming to something like it's called has hazardous a hazardous uh situation where we will continue fighting ourselves even in the south south because we are too money hungry we have leaders who are so self-centered who believe they can be insulting other people who believe they, they are not there to respect our people or our traditional rulers these people, they should be evicted from power. They shouldn't even come closer to, up to power if you don't respect our traditional rulers. No matter what happened, our traditional rulers, they have been able to keep us together till this present day. It wasn't the work of a governor, nor a work of uh, the government of Nigeria. The work of the government of Nigeria was to divide us in a way that we wouldn't even recognize ourselves, that we will not even be represented. So I am saying this uh, because of what we are seeing today. Sorry, I have to type something uh, because So can you hear me, sir? Yeah, I can hear you now. You are welcome. Yeah, okay. I can hear you now loud and uh, clearly. So uh, sorry for for the technical issues I have been facing over here. Yeah, we understand, sir. I've been hearing some of the things that have been said, and uh, as uh, very many as well. Yes, was I not privileged to? to actually hear due to the technical issues. I don't know if I can... Uh, yes, I continue, sir. Something on. Yeah, you can go on, sir. Yeah, the, the matter at hand, uh, in my own perspective, and uh, as known to history, I, I know that the issue that has led to this uh, level started onset right from the the forceful creation of nigeria as a nation uh, if we take a critical look at the the entire situation nigeria as it stand is not really a nation but rather nations merged forcefully without the will of the people into one. Yes. I heard you talking about the British, uh, how they 
they brought Nigeria together and all that. Yeah. It is obvious that uh, the Nigeria people say opinion were not actually, you know, uh, sought as at the time Nigeria was put together. Rather, some few individuals who were seen as leaders of various ethnic groups. Hello? Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you, sir. Continue, sir. Yeah. Some few leaders who were yeah, seen we as like leaders that. of various ethnic groups in the, within the geographical space. Yeah, the secretary is as, talking now. As, that is not known as Nigeria, were put together. Okay. Maybe, should I and, send you uh, another link? Like you are on call, sir. Okay, just a moment. Can I continue, sir? Continue, sir. Just yeah. so I was saying that uh, some leaders of various uh, ethnic groups who were seen as voice were used in bringing about this uh, country called Nigeria. Before this time, it is known to everyone that Benin as an empire had vast land that was being ruled over by the other with powers delegated to various dukedoms and other several kings as well also holding portion of the empire in respect of the other while also having towns and villages headed by the Odion we raised or Kao or hence as the case was and as it still was even though the the power to actually function has been battery reduced by the western uh, uh, system of government that was in forcefully introduced to nigeria yeah i would say nigeria creation was done by error and as such i see no reason why the existence should not also be living on error that is why you see the modern day politicians are not mean anything different from that which they inherited from those who inherited same from the british the only difference is that it is getting worse exactly before now i would say even before the military era the political class in nigeria were not actually interested in uniting the entire ethnic groups within the geographical space called Nigeria today. Rather, each of them were busy see how best they can make their et various ethnic groups the most superior and mighty one in the society. We have people like Awo, Awo Lowo, popularly known as Awo, people like Nadia Zikiwe, Amadu Belo. They were not actually interested about the unity of Nigeria. Because why did I say so? We have reports and statements made by each and every one of these people. Zik, as a person, was only after the Igbo's interest. Yes. Awolowo was after the Yoruba's interest. Amadou Belo was after the Aousa Fulani's interest. And as such, that has been really redocumented and rearranged into the Nigeria constitution that we have today 
I as a person, I do not see that uh, that uh, 1999 constitution as a constitution. It was actually a military declaration 24 that was transferred and presented to us by the Abdul Salami Abubakar military government, which the Obasanjo government of 1999 inherited, put together by 25 people with the first word in the constitution indicating a proper lie. This it states we the people of Nigeria. Now, in a real sense, if a nation is to have a constitution, a constitution, constitution is not something that few individuals put together without the consultation of the people. Constitution is not something to leave. Can you hear me, sir? Yeah, I can hear you. Continue, sir. The constitution is not something that few individuals will just put together. Yes, the National Assembly have the right to enact the law, which is the parliament. They have the right to enact the law. Do they have the right to enact laws without the people's opinion? The, question, the answer is no. For a constitution to be enraged and sustained in a true society, you have to take a yes or no affirmation question to the people's the people and seek for their opinion. We are aware what made the, the, the Midwest a, re, a region in 1963 was due to the plebiscite that was held in that year. Before the plebiscite was held to know if the Western region at that time can be able to bet out a, a, a Midwest, Midwestern region. An assessment was made to know if or whether the Midwest can be able to cater for their need without being a burden to the federal government or being a burden to other existing three regions. The committee that was set up at that time have to tour the entire Midwestern region, which is made up of Edo and Delta today, and part of Bayasa State. The report came out clear that the Midwest is more than efficient and capable to handle the affairs and well-being of the people. To this end, a plebiscite was allowed to play for which a, land, a landslide victory emerged, which led to the creation of the Midwest. Now, when we talk about marginalization, I love when a lot of ethnic groups today talks about marginalization. It is appalling that they refuse to acknowledge the fact that the Midwest, which is now a do and data from the defunct Bender State, are the most marginalized region in Nigeria. Now, we, I am not going to talk about the South South, all of the team, because when we talk about South South, I will be missing it up generally. We know very clearly we had four equal regions in Nigeria before 
states were being created. We had four equal regions. That is to show, that was to say that they have equal representation, like the vice president said. Yeah. We have premier, each of the, the regions had premier and all that. But what do we have today or later? Mind you, two other regions were proposed to be created at that time. Two other regions were proposed, which were not done before military intrude into the governmental system of Nigeria. Please let me get my, my, my charger. My, my laptop battery is running down. Okay. Yes. Uh, before the the issue with uh, the reform or the restructure of Nigeria, uh, each region be having power over their resources. Uh, the Midwest or the, the yes. Okay, it's, it's back again. You can continue. Okay. As we are, we are stopped. So you are welcome. Okay, sir. Uh, that is true. Each region were in control. That is why it was called region created by laws. And the three regions before the Midwest were illegally created because there is no constitutional backup to date that shows that the, the northern region, the eastern region, and the western region had a legitimate creation that back it by law. Yes. There was no plebiscite, no referendum. It was a mere pronouncement, a political arrangement, and it was not constitutionally you know, created. Exactly. But the Midwest was constitutionally created, which made the Midwest and Midwestern region the more legitimate region in Nigeria as we speak. And the Midwest is the only region in Nigeria as we speak that has the legitimate right with all, with, by all standard to apply to the United Nations for self-determination without argument. And if the Midwest, which is a do and data today, and part of Bayesa, should do that, the Nigerian government will have no choice than to come to dialogue table. They have no choice. If we should apply to the United Nations for that, Nigerian government have no choice because the facts are clear. Yes. It is not a jamboree agitation we are not agitation for that but we want to make it clear i want to use this medium to make it make it clear to to everyone that by her standard we are more marginalized than any other region for example i i i, I am going to give analysis and prove why and how the midwest which is the present Edo and Delta, are the ma most marginalized people. When people talk about development here and there, we must agree to the fact that when the regional system of government was in place, which Yakubu got one, started creating states. When he created states, the Midwestern region Sorry. remained as one. No state was created. They only changed it from Midwest to Bende. It yes. was the same. They changed it from, from a region to a state. Midwestern region suddenly became Bender State at that time. Meanwhile, the 
states were created out of eastern region and out of midwest uh, out of western region as well as at the time as i speak the eastern region of hold today have nine states in nigeria the eastern region we talk about four equal regions now yes. the eastern region have nine states as we speak today the nine states are the five Igbo uh, speaking states and four other states that now fall under Niger Delta. That is why I said earlier that I'm not going to miss it all because when we talk, it's a different thing from talking about the region. Yes. I know under Abasha, Abasha's government, military government, that was when the so-called political uh, uh, geopolitical zone of today was created. The six geopolitical zones were created by Abasha government. It was created as a main deception of trying to make the people feel the country to be built and united and all that. Abasha actually did it to make himself the head of state while having vice president, six vice presidents, one representing each of the six geopolitical zones. That was his plan and it, it, it wasn't hidden. He had wanted to become a president while having six different vice presidents, each of them coming from the each of the geopolitical zones. That is how he created the Northeast, Northwest, North Central, Southeast, South South, and uh, Southwest. Today, in the in the in the whole Eastern region, uh, like I was saying, you have nine states today. Yeah. All the Western region have six states today. Old Midwestern region have just two states today, which is Edo and Delta. Two states. That is to say, in a region that used to have one premier, now have nine governors. In a region that used to have one premier, now have six governors. In a region that used to have one premier, the Midwest, now have just two governors. So where is the equality in terms of regional status that was built and organized before 1966? We can see clearly that the, the, the Midwest is marginalized in terms of the numbers of governors we have today because we have just two against others. Now, by creation of states, a region that used to be a region of, of, of her own, and those states today, as it stands, have 18 local governments. Delta state, as it stands, has 25 local government. If you equate Edo and Delta numbers of local government together, that is to say, Edo to uh, uh, the Midwest today is having just 43 local government. I don't know if you are getting me, sir. Yeah, I'm getting you. I'm getting you. Now, Eastern region which was also a region at that time, now have nine states. Five, like I said, from the Igbo speaking part. These five put together have 95 local governments, which is less than half of the Eastern region by land mass less than half of the eastern region the five Igbo speaking states have less than half of the 
eastern region by landmass. If you put a dough and data together by landmass, even though part of the Midwest has been seeded for the creation of Bayesa, by the current landmass of Edo and Delta put together, we have 35,500 square kilometer Edo and Delta landmass put together. You get it? Yes. Why the five Igbo speaking states, the five Igbo speaking states today have 29,525 by landmass, the five states put together? Yes. Edo and Delta is larger than the five Igbo speaking states put together. Now, we are talking about marginalization. These five Igbo speaking states have 95 lo local governments, where Edo and Delta have 43. 100 million naira goes to each local government monthly as allocation. That is to say, the, these five Igbo speaking local governments are getting 9.5 billion naira monthly, where Edo and Delta is getting 4.3 billion to local governments. The other four local governments that are made up of the old eastern region, which now fall under South South, which are Aquaibo, Cross River, uh, uh, Bayasa, and River States. These four states put together have 64 local governments. That is to say, they get 6.4 billion era monthly to local government. By the time you had this 6.4 billion era to, to, to the uh, 9.5 billion, put it together, you see that the whole eastern region have more, far more than what the, the Midwest yes are getting today and because they have more states than us they have more states than us they have more governors they have more senators each state by the 1999 constitution of nigeria even though it remains illegal enable every state to produce three senators each. Because the Midwest of old, which is now Edo and Delta, we now have just six senators. How can six senators serve as a majority in the midst of multitude out of 109 at the National Assembly? We have just six senators. The, the five Igbo speaking states have 15 senators. Why 12 comes from the other South South uh, states? If you have this 12 to the 15 of the Igbo speaking part, you have 27 senators comes from the eastern region, hold eastern region, 27 senators. While the old Midwest have six. Also, you have as of representative. We have 360 as of representative members in Nigeria. I am going to give the landmarks of of uh, these states, you see how people, how who is being marginalized. And those states, like I said, have 17,802 square kilometer. Yeah. 17,802. Why Delta state have 17,698? Like I said, if you put these two together, you have 35,500 square kilometer. Now, let me give you 
from the eastern region, the landmarks from the eastern region, specifically first from the Igbo speaking part. Like I said, if you put Edo and Delta together, it is larger, still larger than the five Igbo states put together. Yes. Enugu state. Enugu state is the largest that comes from the uh, 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 from uh, the five Igbo states. Enugu state by landmass have just 7,161. Enugu state. Yet, Enugu have 17 local governments. Edo state that is 17,000 by landmass have 18 local governments. Enugu that is 7,000 7, by landmass have 17 local governments. We have here Abia state. Abia state by landmass have 6,320 by landmass square kilometer. They also have 17 local governments. That is to say, if you share a do into three, is one part of Abia. Yet, they have 17 local governments where a do have it in. They have more representation than us. A Boeing state is just 5,670 by landmass. A Boeing state have 13 local governments. Imo state, the second uh, smallest local government in the five Igbo state, speaking state, have 5,530 by landmass. Guess what? Imo state have 27 local governments. So if, if 1.8 billion is going to a those states local 18 local government monthly, the Imo state is getting 2.7 billion to local government monthly. Imo state alone. 2.7 billion. Anambra have 21 local government with just 4,844. 4,844. On record, Anabra is the second most smallest state in Nigeria. The only state Anabra is bigger than is Lagos State. Lagos is the smallest. Yes. In Nigeria, Lagos have 27 local government, no to law. Even though Tinubu created additional 20 as a governor, which is not approved by federal government though it is running the state are funding that but no to law that the nigeria law is is 27. at the national is, okay, you want to say something sir oh we can't, we can't hear him yeah i can't hear him yeah so i say at the national assembly Federal House of Rep Representative. I also have detailed reports here. Each of the local government representatives, their names, the names of the House of Rep members, the names, the, the local governments they represent, there are various constituencies, the states. I have the list here. It is very clear, obvious. And those states only have 10, 10 as of rep members. Delta have 11, making 21 from the eastern region, from the uh, Midwest. Just 21 representatives at the, national, at the uh, federal house of rep. Meanwhile, each of those states are just mentioned. Some of them have more members, like Anabra, that is the smallest state. Anabra is the smallest state apart from Lagos in Nigeria. Let me say the second most smallest state with just 4,844 square kilometers against a state that is 
17,000 uh, 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 plus. Anabra have 24 members, uh, uh, 24 hours of rep members. 24. Yeah. But yet, these are the people that will talk of marginalization. We saw the primary that was heard. The primary that was heard by the APC. Anabra have over 50 delegates. Imo have over 50 delegates. Likewise, other states from the East. Ebo have 30, 39 delegates. Guess what? Out of all the Easterners that contested in that primary, with the numbers of delegates put together, the Easterners representative, or let me say the aspirants, which is the governor of a Boeing state and one other man from a Boeing as well, only scored 39 votes. The governor scored 38, while the other man, I can't remember his name, scored just one vote. That is to say, and Rochas from Imo scored zero. <laughs> yes. That is to say, out of the 50 delegates from Imo where he governed before now, none voted for him and none also voted for a boy governor who is an Igbo. none voted for other representative at this time you begin to wonder because they cry of marginalization who is marginalizing who exactly are their people, their delegates, their politicians, having the interest of the eastern part at heart? The question is clearly no. It is no because if the delegates wish to have their person in power, they will all vote. The, the vote would have reflected the numbers of delegates in Imo, in, uh, in Anabra, and other parts would have reflected in that primary as a case study that they are willing to have their person. The Tinubu's vote would have been reduced. He might have won due to the stepping down primary that was held. He might have won, but it would have been seen that the Igbo de uh, uh, delegates voted for their own, or yes. rather, they took the vote, they shared it between Tinubu and Lawan, like the uh, uh, Abia's delegates yeah. were all instructed to vote for Lawan. They gave it to Lawan. While the Igbo's delegates gave theirs to Tinubu, Anabra's delegates gave theirs to Tinubu, they shared it without voting for their own. Tomorrow they come out and tell us they are being marginalized. When they as a group cannot wake up to get a consensus candidate for themselves, for the rest of the country to support. That is the only region where 50 people will be contesting to be governor in a state. That is an act of greed, act yes. of selfishness, an act of uh, 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 one seeking to have it all without the consideration of the father in the midst of many. Only one can lead. Our personal interest as politicians in Nigeria must be put behind the interest of the people not putting the interest of the people behind us 
when you put the interest of the people behind us or behind you as a person, there's no way the interest of seeking to remember the people we reflect in our activities. Only when we put the people front, that is when we can reflect and always have that peak to make the people smile. The political setting in Nigeria today has been bastardized. Yes. In, exactly. To the extent that we no longer have hope. That is the truth. I saw a comment a while ago while I uh, I was having technical issues here. I saw a comment that someone wrote that uh, the Nigeria youth are weak. Someone also replied saying that uh, what do you expect them to do? Something like that. The truth is when one finds is or herself in the state of confusion, it can actually lead to weakness. Yes. But I must also say that Nigerians' youth are not weak. Rather, they are not willing. We do not have the willingness to act. And one of the things that is drawing us back is because youth in the Nigeria polity today are the ones assisting the elderly to loot the nation. I can tell you, I, I played a grassroots politics before I left Nigeria. My kind of person, I don't engage in things that has to do with uh, my practices. My interest as a person is to see how things can be better. You see, there are, I can categorically say that the youths that are waiting to get to power and, to, and use the opportunity to better themselves are more, far more than the the elders that are hitting us dry today. Yes. That is the basic fact. Many people today who say the youth, they want youth to be president, they want youth to be governor, they want youth to take care of the, the, the entire system and structure. The fact remains that the, the elders that are destroying our politics today were youth when they started playing the politics. Exactly. They were youth. <laughs> they started as youth. Yes. But because they have tasted power and they are benefiting so much from the system, they rather die than to see them live and have somebody else, whether youth or not, to just come and take that opportunity. And the youth of today, majority, I will say majority, I will not say all, but majority that are involved in politics, by all standard that they follow, which are abnormal, is to ensure that they surpass the corrupt elders when they if opportune to be there. To surpass them in corruption, not for betterment. Yes. Because we have not found ourselves in a situation whereby the system has been under a structural plan of whoever comes in, we take his or our benefit, leave. The next person comes you take and leave. They don't care about the future. Nigeria is dying. Yes. Frank. Nigeria is dying because the way things are going now, a time will come. People will start hitting themselves. Politics do not know religion. Politics do not know tribe. 
he does not know ethnicity. Yes. He does not even know brother. The way Amana politics is played in Nigeria is played to gallery that we only become friends when there is time for campaign. Nigeria politics is a case of all for the greedy and nothing for the needy. We now have a system that produced more corrupt leaders than true leadership. Very soon, campaign will come. People will start sharing rice. People will start sharing mangi, salt. These are things that ordinarily, if the society is better, is good for the common man. If you share it during your campaign, nobody will take. But I can tell you that because the system has become so porous, corruption, poverty has now been sustained. Many people are just waiting for campaign to come now so that they can have the opportunity to grab rice. Yes. Many people are already planning now for that election day so that they can have the opportunity to get free 1,000 error. That is the truth. without even knowing that they are dead in that country. It is really, yes. <laughs> really, really tantamount. And delirious to the hearts of those who think and have human feelings that the situation of the country, politically, economically, and otherwise, I tell you, the situation has become so worse. Somebody, as at 2000 and between 1999, between 1999 to 2007, somebody who was a PA, personal assistant, is today a governor and was even trying to be president, contested with, with, uh, uh, article the other day yeah after the time he was a pa to somebody who was the minister of aviation i know and i was always traveling with my boss i know them i'm speaking of the person of the current governor of Baoshi state he was a pa to isa yeguda when Isayo Guda was the Minister of uh, Aviation, my former boss at that time was appointed, who is a friend to Isayo Guda, as the MD, Federal Airport Authority of Nigeria. I may not make sure his name. He's also from Baoshi State. Bala Mohammed was a PA. To Isa Yuguda. If not by systematic corruption and all that, we all saw what happened. Even in the primary that was there. So the issue of we shouting all the time about Nigeria, it is far beyond shouting. We need action. But it is unfortunate that those that are coming up in the name of youth to say we want you to be this, I can tell you all of them are deceptive. They are very deceptive, trying to, to live under the auspices of youth for, for leadership to attain. By the time they attain, forget them. Politics have not been seen as an avenue to easily exploit the people, 
and first they seek to attain. When they attain, they leave the cat out of the bag. Then you begin to see the real person in them. Yeah. How many, let's ask ourselves, I have seen campaigns in Europe, how politicians campaign. How many politicians will you see in Europe kneeling down for voters? <laughs> they, go on campaign, they go on campaign, they kneel down and say, please vote for me. They, their interest is to go there, they present their speech, the message they have, they tell you what they want to do. If you buy into it, you vote for them. If you don't buy into it, it's not a big deal. No. It is what they think is best for the people at the time that they will present, their strategy they present. For in Nigeria, we were talking about royal fathers issue. In Nigeria, you see politicians. They only go to royal fathers to seek for blessings, not that they respect them. No. They don't respect them because their activity speaks. It shows that their interest of going there is just to play to gallery for people not to say they didn't come. We also what <coughs> happened recently when Wiki started his campaign indicating interest to be president, he went to Bini to inform a royal father. Tinubu came, he went to Bini. Our brother Dele Momodu also went to Bini, and several others. Amechi and others. Yeah, several others. But Atiku came. He never visited the palace. He only visited the governor. And the governor, who is the son of the land, supposed as a leader to make sure he bring Atiku to the palace. <coughs> if Atiku, if Atiku is sensible enough as a person, he would have also indicated interest. But I want to say publicly here today, I believe this is on her. I want to suggest, I do not have the power, but my opinion is my opinion and it is my opinion. Nobody can change it, yes. whether it is accepted or not. My opinion remains my opinion. When it is time, when it is time for campaign proper, I believe Atiku will want to visit the palace. That is when he will remember that there is royal blessings. I want to suggest whoever that we get this message should please help us tell our royal palace, our royal father, the Bini traditional council, that for Atiku to have ignored not, not, not commit to the uh, uh, aspiration bid for the candidacy. The palace should never also welcome him if he choose to seek for royal blessings before the election proper. The palace should not receive him because he failed the test. <coughs> him and Obaseki in this situation are cohort. Yes. Him and Obaseki are cohort. They have heard. They have heard. And their errors must be made known to them that they heard. I want to solicit and hold a royal palace not to accept their intention. If they ever do, I know they will. I know they will when it is time for campaign. They will all let them let them go to Gamia Palace and and uh, seek for blessing there. 
Because I heard now that Obaseki is building Ogyamie Palace. Let him go and do that. I think we should go there. The time, the hand shall tear. Obaseki only have two years plus. Only have two years plus to live there. He will live. The royal, the royal school has been and will always be. Yes. To the same line of authority that God has instituted. Why the governor is a come and go seat. It has no family line. And it also has no <coughs> political, one particular political uh, line. So therefore, I think with all that is happening, in Benin parlance, we'll say, in Osogutu Ueran, it will also go. Yes. Whoever goes to the base of a, of, a, of a wood, of a tree, try to be shaking it, the person will end up shaking his or herself because the wood remain, remain firm and can never be moved. Can so, never be moved. So no matter what they, what they, will, what they will do, they try to do, we all know that they are trying to play politics with the royal stool. That this is where the constitution. I have always said it, even before I left Nigeria. I've always said to people, if whoever wants to fix Nigeria must first of all fix the constitution. <laughs> Nobody can tell me. We are talking about we are talking about uh, uh, one economist. There is no economist that can fix Nigeria. That is the truth. Because yes. what keeps a nation running, the thing that modifies countries, that set out standard rules and regulation on how and when things should be done, is a constitution. Nigeria is like, like uh, how would I put it, is like a car that is placed on a wheelbarrow. And you ask the wheelbarrow pusher to push to push it. I don't see how imaginable it would be for a wheelbarrow to 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 push a car, and heavy car. That is the situation of Nigeria. The constitution given to Nigeria cannot permit because Nigerians are yearning now for somebody like Peter Obi. And, Yes, Peter Obi have the quality, his experience, he have the the well know how economically and all that. He's more than capable for the job. That is the truth. But if you take a look at the situation, Labour Party where is contested from. I don't even know if they have a councillor in Nigeria. I don't even know. But I know that they do not even have a local government chairman. They do not even have a, a House of Assembly member. They do not even have a governor. They do not even have a senator. They do not even have a House of Rep member. They don't have anything. No, let, let me tell you, in politics, I heard him talking about structure, structure. The people are saying he has no structure. No, no, no political party can win without structure. That is the truth. You cannot win without structure. What are those structures? The people you just see chanting. They, take a look at it. How many people know him in the north? <coughs> you cannot, you cannot be president of Nigeria if you do not win north. It can, it is not possible that you become president of Nigeria if you do not win in north. It is never possible. Even if you win the whole seat in South, then not is the key. Politics is a game of number. Let us not de de uh, uh, deceive ourselves. Yes. Politics is a game of number. 
if you don't have the number to get it. And secondly, one cannot win election in the social media. You can't win an election in social media. That is the truth. Many of us talking here today, having this awareness, we are saying all this on here because we have access to social media. Yes. And majority of the people chanting it out, be chanting, chanting on social media. So what it did more than what is happening now, what Mr. B is doing on social media, how did it end? It is not all about chanting Peter B, Peter B. We should look inwardly what is on ground. I will say, in my own view, Peter Obi miscalculated his plan of becoming president now. He should have started it long ago while being remaining in under a well-structured political party or seeking to form alliance. I learned that the alliance he was trying to form with uh, Concourse, so with the NNPP just collapsed now. Reason because Reason because uh, I will be random now soon due to word of time. Yeah. Reason because Kokaso do not want to serve as Peter Obi's uh, vice president. Neither do Peter Obi wants to serve as vice president to Kokaso. This is what we are talking about. That everybody wants to be the head. Yes. Nobody wants to be an assistant. Because, yes. We were even thinking if both of them should partner <coughs> at least on Kwaso have ground in, in not just in Kanu but in the entire north. He would have been able to pull out votes for Peter Obi. Peter Obi would have been able to pull out votes from the east and probably get some votes from the south south. Although it would have still be difficult for them to win, but at least they would have been able to show that third force people are talking about. But the way it stands, I would say categorically here, Peter Obi goes nowhere. He goes nowhere. That is his basic truth. Because of the, 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 the structure, the political structure we know that we have, he goes nowhere. Let us not de deceive ourselves. The case still remains between PDP and APC. Not until Nigeria people come together, that constitution must be dismantled. And even if Peter Obi succeed, the, the entire youth of Nigeria succeed in giving him the mandate, how is he going to rule? It will be difficult for him to lead Nigeria because, one, we know he, he may have good intention. He has been tried and tested. He may also have good intention at this time, but the, will the constitution allow him to govern Nigeria the way he wants it? Will the constitution allow him to govern Nigeria the way Nigerians want it? The question is no. Because the constitution have given so much abnormal conflict to itself, has given so much abnormal illegal right to the National Assembly to do and undo. The, another question is, will he be able to twist the National Assembly that will be in his government to come to terms and condition of the people by way of seeking to make the people happy? The question is no. We have in our country, we are even as of threat members, people are talking about yes, as of threat members in Nigeria, have money more than the US president. Yes. Have money more than the US president. If you convert 
what they earn in Naira to dollar, it is still more than what U.S. president <coughs> every month. And the last time the U.S. government increased their president and vice president salary was around 2006. Ever since, whoever comes still hand the same thing. But in Nigeria, you now have a country where senators, a third world country, a third world country as of rep members, not just NATO now, and more than U.S. president. The vice president was talking about furniture allowance, various allowance. That is where the corruption lies. Their salaries chose one point something million. But by the time you put their take home together, a senator take home 13 point something million naira monthly. How can a country where you, you have people as governors taking pension, someone will work for 35 years, you pay that person one point something million naira as pension, as gratuity. While there are some states, states like uh, in one of the northern states, I can't really figure out now, is getting 700, the ex governor is getting 700 million naira as pension monthly. 700 million naira as pension monthly. That is what an ex governor is getting. Pension monthly. Why? Somebody who work in the civil service for 35 years, some are getting 45,000 naira monthly. Why somebody who just ruled as governor for four years, if opportune, maybe eight years, as far as we are a governor, the way they have now made it in Nigeria, whoever was a governor even for one month that was removed by court, they still put him on that pension. The state still pay as compensation. It is, it, it, it is really appalling that Nigeria situation at the moment has run far more than uh, decadency. We don't even know how to quantify the situation of the country's uh, politics. That is, let me, let me just stop here due to the word of time. I don't know. Okay, sir. I feel really discouraged over the whole, the entire. Situation. Yeah, we we are discouraged and uh, also a little bit sad about what is going on in our country. Uh, and I want to reinstate uh, this: the governor of a two state uh, doesn't have the power uh, to create a chieftaincy title in uh, a two state. Uh, this power lies with the Oba of Benin, but the governor of Edo State has the right to suspend any chief in Edo State. So uh, we have to put this clear. And the judgment of uh, the Chief Justice of Edo State uh, has uh, reinstated. And I now understand that he made a mistake in his judgment when he was writing, putting up the write-up. Now the write-up is fully corrected and uh, stated that Arisco is not in any way uh, uh, in the position uh, to take the, the title of Ogiamia because uh, Arisco is not, a, is not a blood of the Ogiamia family. Although his mother is from Ogiamia family, but he's not a child of Ogiamia. Uh, before Arisco yeah, could uh, you see, Mr. You see, sorry, sir. Let me could okay. Every... Go on. Let me really say this, sir. Everything boils down to the same policies we are talking about. Yes. We know the rightful Ogiamia is a uh, Osabo, wherever yes. he is, may God bless him. No one can say that he's dead not until yes. confirmation is made. But I know that he has been away for almost 40 years now, or more than. Nobody is here about. 
But I want to say, if he's still alive, there must be someone that knows his whereabouts. Yes. So we should consider that as a top secret that has been hidden from the public because wherever he is, he must have contacts. Yes. That is the, that is the truth. Now, when our area was joined his ancestors, in 2016, that is when this issue of a risk started. Yes. The truth remains that they did it because they haven't heard anything about Osabo, the, with all due respect, the Ogiamia that we know. Yes. The Benins generally respect Ogiamia title and also know that the title is given to Ogiamia by the Oba. And it also have a role that it play in the in the Benin custom and tradition, especially during the coronation. So when they got the the tip that Oba Edewa joined his ancestors, that is when they started these things. They quickly want to install somebody as Ogiame, which they have no traditional rights to do and they have no legal right as well according to the law the bender state law of uh, 1963 at that time they have no they have no they have no 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 power to do that they did it hoping that the palace would come to negotiating table with them. Yes. You don't negotiate with people or no people. You negotiate with people you know. And also, palace don't negotiate with anybody. Exactly. Rather, the palace seek to do the right thing. There's no way a risco can be an Ogamian. One is only maternally related. Yes not paternally and two what is this closeness with osarobo if it were to be maternally related what because the way i know not just tradition even by law by law of inheritance by law of inheritance if someone have no child the next of kin could either be his brother, father, mother, or immediate cousin. That is the law of inheritance. Is Arisko directly a cousin to Sarobo? The question is no. It's not directly a cousin, neither is it the first cousin. It's maternally related because they felt Arisco is the stubborn one they can put up front. Who cooked up this old idea were not actually the core Ogiamians. Yeah. I would say the, the radicals among them did it even without the concept, consent of the the leaders of Ogiamia family. Arisco being rich, he felt he could do it with his money. That is why the government of Adans, Ali Oshomole, took Arisco to court. People should get this clear, this message clear. It wasn't the palace that took Arisco to court. Because some people are celebrating out of ignorance yes. that Arisco has won the palace. They should understand that the palace never had hand in taking Arisco to court. It was the state government who toyed on the line of uh, 
the part of the, the state Gazate law. They took Arisco to court. He, at this time, his government has withdrew the case. By law, we know that when two people are fighting in court, by all understanding, and one decides to withdraw, it shows that the one who withdraw the case are tired of, of prosecuting the case or no longer have interest in prosecuting the case or it shows also show a sign of defeat like submitting to the other that is what obaseki had just done obaseki did it to me it is an act of stupidity for him to have done that he did it thinking he was going to insult the palace with it on not to him that he is being stupid and and uh, bringing cause upon himself okay i don't no matter what he will do i don't see how it will be possible their plans it will not be possible they can try they can even pay people on social media to talk nonsense speak against the palace it will not do anything because the situation we find ourselves today we know a lot of people we now have a lot of mad dogs on social media speaking rubbish what is never what never was and what will never be they begin to say them against the palace some of the people doing these things when the palace or uh, the president Oba came he came to sanitize the system the corruption under his father due to old age and all that at a point the father of our blessed memory wasn't handling cases himself anymore so a lot of corrupt chiefs within the kingdom took that as an avenue to handle so many cases yeah. some do it in their houses they will say a guatane that is the palace have said it meanwhile yeah. palace never heard or said anything knew nothing about those cases they handled and all that they collect bribes a lot but this over has handled cases himself and has has punished a lot of chiefs has relegated a lot and has also you know uh, removed some chiefs from their positions as a result of this some of those chiefs who have now become a saboteur to the to the to the uh, empire and the entire people the beneath in general these are the people trying to fabricate and causing mayhem for which they are not going to succeed a risk as a person is already is is already out of the way so it is only those who do not understand what is going on or do not have awareness of the entire situation that we applaud Arisco and his cohort. Obaseke himself will see the end of it very soon. Yes. <laughs> okay. Thank you, sir. And uh, thank you, our viewers, for staying with us. I think this was this is the longest uh, uh, live uh, broadcast we have had. And uh, thank everyone for your support. I will be coming back very soon uh, during the weekend or maybe after the weekend. We don't know yet, but please stay with us. Don't go away. We have more for you and then we have more analysis and more explanation for you. So thank you. Thank you, Honorable Secretary. Thank you for your good job. Uh, the Vice President already left because of a network problem. 
and uh, my thanks also goes to him. Yeah, and uh, all to the executive leaders in the house and the uh, honorable members, I say thank you. And uh, please subscribe and uh, like our page. We are present in, in, in Facebook, in YouTube, Instagram, Twitter, and so many more, uh, like Pritzet and, and others. We are also present there. Please try as much as possible also to spread our message, to share our, our message so that people know more about us, know about our message and others. So thank you very much. So Honorable Secretary, sir, your last uh, statement to our people or advice so that we can round up. Yes, sir, but I would say that um, let me hold our people, the people of Great Bini, whatever, they should be moved uh, over the nonsensical behavior. No, I, I, I celebrated his victory second term even though i never worked for him in his first term in second term i can see yeah. i celebrated this victory my point where i vote in nigeria although i wasn't there i know the role i played in ensuring that he won but the, the way he is going when you see something you say something i sincerely yes with all respect and loyalty to our people and our kingdom because we cannot have a state without having a kingdom yes we cannot have obaseki without having the kingdom therefore whatever he does that is against the wish and will of the traditional stool especially that which we affect the entire people of Benin origin. It should be denounced and at the same time be seen as a traitor. Okay, so. Therefore, I urge everyone not to be weary in mind because that which has been will continually be. The palace okay. tool is is unmovable. Exactly. We only understand that the constitution has done great damages to us by even placing the traditional council under the local government. That is why the state government across Nigeria always seek to relegate their monarch. We saw what happened in Kanu State, how the governor reduced the emir of Kanu by creating five equal emirates to weaken the governor, the, the, the emir, and later also removed the emir. So that is the politics Obaseki is trying to play, but we know that it cannot succeed. That is all for now yeah thank you very much and uh, i wish everyone a great day and a healthy day and i wish to see you all in good health so thank you and uh, god bless you so thank you sir